Thanks, Leah, for joining us on the Regional Football Hub. We're certainly really pleased to have you on today. It's really great to have someone who's played for the national team and now someone who's helping contribute to players to also play for the national team. So welcome and thanks for coming on. Thanks, Andrew, and hello, everyone. Beautiful. So you uh, started in Katoomba. What can you tell us about your junior football experience from Katoomba when you were starting out in the football world? Yeah, look, um, I'm a Blue Mountains girl through and through. So I've, I've grown up um, in the town of Wentworth Falls um, pretty much my entire life until um, later on when I, I moved away for football. Um, I started out um, playing for a local club called Wentworth Falls um, Soccer Club that the council recently announced an upgrade to the clubhouse. So thank you, Blue Mountains Council, for that. It's an exciting time. <laughs> Um, great to see that we're, we're putting in resources into our more regional areas um, in terms of football. Uh, so I grew up, yeah, playing for Went to Fortune United Soccer Club. Uh, there was myself and one other girl in the entire club uh, when I first started, and we played um, there until the age of about eleven, um, in which. Um, I then tried out for a local representative team and, and wasn't selected and um, went home and got the soccer ball out the next, the next day in the backyard and <laughs> just con continued on with it. Um, and I was actually fortunate enough to, to be selected in the first ever full-time Curva Squad program um, out of Parkley there, um, run by Oscar Gonzalez um, at the age of, of 11. Um, that's when I... I began uh, sort of training in that environment as well as uh, under David Lee in the, the Sydney West um, programs, the, the old zone programs um, that were available at the time. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my, early, my early days. I certainly, although I was involved in those programs, I certainly spent a lot of time by myself um, at, at Winter Falls at Pitt Park, training in the backyard, um, we had a, an old trampoline we used to tip on its side and my dad actually spray painted targets um, for me and my brothers to, to shoot at and, and practice our striking at home. So there's certainly a lot of time spent um, on my own training despite going into those programs at, at 11. Excellent. So Leah, obviously um, you've ticked two massive milestones everyone sort of dreams of as representing your country as a, both a player and then doing it all again and, and reaching another massive milestone to do it as a coach. As much as you probably would love to still have the boots on running around, do you prefer one over the other? Um, look, they've both given me um, excellent life experiences and good opportunities. So um, to be able to, to play the game and be out there on the pitch with your teammates and to represent your country, um, I, I don't think anything ever replaces that. Um, so I finished playing um, at an earlier age um, due to an injury, um, and that certainly took a toll for a little while on on me as a as a person trying to figure out who I who am I if I'm not a, a football player. Um, but I've obviously been fortunate to. Uh, it was actually a tournament. My first tournament I went to with a youth team was the Proctor Cup in Bathurst. Uh, a very good friend of mine, Rob Hutchinson, um, contacted me that the under 14s MacArthur Rams were were in transition with their coach and. Could he pick me up on the way out to Bathurst um, to attend the Proctor Cup and um, say a few words to some of the girls and try and boost morale um, for them? So sure enough, on their way out to Bathurst, he picked me up from Winter Falls and um, the two-day experience out there was was fantastic. It, it really ignited a, a passion in, in me that I didn't know I, I had for coaching. I never thought as a player that I'd become a coach. Um, I always did private, like individual training sessions through, through my time in the US in college to to make a bit of cash and those sort of things and get by. And I enjoyed it, but definitely that experience um, opened me up to a a whole new love um, for the game. So I'm, I feel fortunate for that. Cool. And obviously, leading into your sort of first experiences coaching, and then being able to go away to national youth championships. Um, with sort of football New South Wales and seeing the regional kids uh, that are participating up there, do you what do you see the difference I suppose between the regional and metro players or, or what stands out for the regional kids when they're up there? 
Look, I think the regional kids have a, a, a long history of, of having that fighting spirit and that passion and love for the game. And um, if we look back um, just in my early days of coaching and we look at players like Jada Wyman and Eliza Amendolia and, and those young kids coming through, um, and even now we see it in, in some of the younger players in Zali Goldsworthy and, and that sort of thing. They've got this strong fighting um, character that I love and that winning sort of mentality is something that I believe it, it's difficult to coach. Um, having that innate ability to compete and um, to come from um, a background where you might not have the opportunity to access the, the best best coach at any time, all the resources for um, top training facilities. So I really admire um, what what comes out of out of country areas in terms of the kids drive and ambition. Um, as I said, we've seen some some strong players come out of the, the Chapman girls, uh, um, Kate Lawson. There's a strong history of country kids doing really well um, that are driven and committed to the game, just like a kid who lives in the city. Yep. So across all your roles, and you're a pretty busy person, with all the regional players that you've, you've had come across in your programs, is there any common challenges that you probably could foresee they've all had or is it more dependent on the individual player? And then how do you best help them through those challenges that they have? Yeah, look, I think it's definitely um, the individual player, um, whether uh, any footballer, um, you look at the, the person and everybody's different. Um, so different challenges that, that kids in regional areas face are, um, I guess the most obvious one is, do they relocate um, into urban or, or city areas? And um, it's not for everybody. So some kids actually might do better by staying in their, their environment with some extra resourcing of, of what coaching staff can, can provide for them, whereas others come into the city and um, might attend a, a sports high school or, or play for, you know, whether it's an MPL team or an institute program, academy, whatever um, path they go and do really well as, as well. It's, it's up to the individual. Um, and if I use one example of a, we've recently um, had a young player come into Sydney um, who it's taken some time for her to transition and, and get used to living away from home. And we do it in a way where um, she goes home every single holiday, initially needed to go home more often than not, but now has, has developed a, a good sense of belonging and close friendships. And that, that social connection uh, is so important for, for these players. Um, but as I said, it, it is not a you have to move into the city areas for country kids. That's I, I don't believe that's the direction we should should be going. It is a that it's a must. Yeah, cool. I mean, um, there's more opportunities for players now, and there's better resources in the regional areas in terms of coaching, and then you know even access from coaches into coaches like you to be able to help players as they go their journey. So it's it's refreshing to note they don't have to make a decision at 14 if it doesn't suit them to, to get to, you know, Sydney or Melbourne or wherever else they need to go. So, you know, that's, that's positive to hear as well. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned also about uh, the injury, you know, curtailed the playing career and that forced you into coaching a little bit or incentivized you to go to coaching. Mm -hmm. Did you have much thought prior to that, that that was something that you might want to do in the future? Did it come earlier than you planned or was it that moment that kind of spurred the coaching path on for you? Um, yeah, look, it was, it was definitely that moment. Um, I, I've been fortunate to have some very, very good coaches um, as a player during my time, a diverse range of, of coaches. Um, I actually um, have a, a teaching degree. Um, so possibly I've always thought I wanted to go down that educator um, sort of pathway. Um, so, I, yeah, I completed my, my teaching degree at a, a college in the US. Um, and as I said, I was involved in just running one-on-one -on -one training sessions and, and those sort of things with, with kids in the Connecticut area, that, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then, yeah, that experience. And then I was, I was afforded um, some other good opportunities moving forward where I was around um, elite environments and then not, not elite environments. Um, and it just, again, I've, I've developed a passion for it. Uh, it it's enjoyable. Um, going to training for me is, is the highlight. 
Um, I love arriving, the session, you finish a session and you're with your colleagues and you, you reflect on it and go, wow, that was a, a good session, right? Or probably need to work on, on developing this next time. So all of that is is why I coach and what I'm, I'm getting out of it the most at the moment. Right. Mm. I guess we um, so often talk about the challenges players face to reach national teams or whatever. What are some of the challenges you faced in becoming a coach of a team like that? Um, look, I think as a as a nation, we're developing our our pathways um, in, into coaching. And again, I spent a lot of time um, in the in the United States um, with my my playing career. Um, so I was in college there and then I went on to play in the professional league there and um, from there went to Sweden. So I've experienced a, um, a broad range of styles of coaching, co- um, different um, environments where um, I witness the pathways. What I, I, I do see is different is there's more opportunities in other countries, there's more jobs available. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we're in a landscape where there, there may be only one or two top jobs um, available um, at, the, at the different levels um, so that's certainly a challenge but um, in saying that I think if you go back to the, the reason you coach and if it is because you have a love of the game and and you're passionate about it whether I'm coaching in a national team space or whether I'm, I'm, I'm helping out at the local soccer club um, all of it is is fulfilling and you mentioned there that you come through the college system. What did you find the advantages of doing that in terms of? Look, definitely um, why I originally went over was because it was the best place for me to balance um, my school as well as my football. I've always gone down the, the academic pathway. It's always been a priority of mine. So um, attending college in the US um, at the time was the best um, thing for, for me to do where I felt I was the most supported now in saying that Australia is advanced in different opportunities um, they have available I know Western Sydney University and Macquarie University offer some fantastic um, scholarships for different players at the moment and, and those sort of things um, so just at that point in time it was the best opportunity for me to do school play football at the highest level um, and it's just something as a kid I always wanted to do. I wanted to play in the US college system. And you talk about playing football at the highest level there. Do you think now the highest level for girls are these are now the English Premier League? Now um, it's emerged a little bit? Look, I think it's an emerging league um, and it's becoming a very strong, strong league. Um, if we look at, at the landscape the the league in Germany is is very very strong um, obviously the French um, are putting a lot of investment and as a Spain and a lot of the European countries to be honest um, so I think that the English league is is still very much developing um, but it is it looking that it's it's going to end up eventually a powerhouse Great. so we've spoken a little bit on, on here in terms of mentoring and, and having mentors I've, do you have a mentor at the moment? Have you had mentors in the past? How do you see mentors in general for coaches? Yeah, look, I think they play um, such a strong role in any coach or even player's development. Um, I've always been fortunate enough to immerse myself with a few mentors. I think it's important that uh, you, you don't get caught just having sort of who's in your backyard or who's in your sport as your mentor. Um, so I actually lean on a few people um, across different sports. I've got a strong uh, mentor who's in the in the hockey space, works with the Hockey Roos and the youth national team set up in hockey. Uh, and then I have sort of my football kind of kind of mentors. Um, but I'm finding in coaching, especially during this period, and that bouncing ideas off a variety of different people. Some some things you take, some things you don't. Um, sometimes they tell you when to pull your head in. Um, I think it's important. Cool. So obviously there's, um, like you said before, limited coaches and resources in the country areas and having a mentor to lean on for, for sort of country coaches, what advice would you have for them? Obviously, you know, a lot of the country coaches, once they do get to a level, then move on maybe to a, a metro area. So it's hard to have those mentors in the regional areas. Mm-hmm. What, what advice is it for, for those guys growing up there? 
Look, the first thing um, with that is if you are a coach who's involved at a high level or advanced level or referee or um, administrator, whatever it might be, and you have come from a country area, I think it's important that we understand the responsibility and duty we have to to sort of always stay in touch and give back to those areas. Um, at the end of the day, it's where we're, we've all come from. We're a product of, of those environments. So um, I think that's an important part. I would encourage um, people to sign up as mentors and, and reach out to um, your local clubs. Again, appropriate to what you can fit into your working schedule. Um, but I think that's a key part that we just don't leave and that's it. Uh, the second part of that is if, if you don't ask, and it's something I've learned sort of in my career, um, if you don't ask, you don't know. And and what's the worst thing that can happen? Somebody says to you, look, at the moment I, I don't have time to commit to this or even if they just share a couple of resources with you or involve you in a team meeting or, or whatever it might be, um, I think that's important that, that people sort of do a bit for, to stand up for themselves and ask for things, for sure. I mean, I hundred percent agree with that. I think I think one you've got to essentially be aligned with choosing your mentor. But I think from the coach's perspective, they, they need to be willing to ask and seek help. And the, and the worst is they say, "Look, I can't or I'm busy." But yeah. I, I think if the answer is I, I can help you, then I think that that's definitely worth you know posing the question and putting yourself out there for someone that you respect who you think can help you grow as a, a person and as a coach. Mm -hmm. Great. I guess regional coaches don't always have that person there to watch their sessions um, like they may do in metro areas so that they can get feedback on their sessions. So I was just wondering, what would you say to a coach who doesn't always have someone there to give them feedback? How would they get them, give themselves feedback, I guess? Yeah, look, I think there's two things to that. Um, and it's something that I probably didn't start doing until... Um, more, more recently and that's actually filming yourself whether you're coaching or whether you're um, speaking to a group of people and then going on and, and reflecting on that so I think like self-reflection um, is something everybody can do so if, if you have the opportunity where um, if it's on the iPhone it doesn't need to be the, the latest drone or what a microphone or anything like that if you can um, film yourself coaching or have somebody an injured player or a friend um, film yourself in a session or whether you're giving a presentation. Um, even that, I think, is um, really a good skill and that to take into your coaching. Um, another thing that I found useful is ensuring that you have that critical friend, that um, the, the key in that is that you trust them and that um, their intentions are to help you. Um, that way that when you are receiving feedback from them, um, that isn't always going to be good and if you – if you look at that sort of exercise, you go, I'm doing this to improve myself and you understand that um, it's not going to be perfect and you're going to hear things that you don't want to hear. Uh, I think that's a really key part of developing yourself, whether it be in coaching or business, whatever it is in life, um, that's an important person to have. Awesome. Obviously, Lee, you mentioned you work in a lot of different roles with football as well as um, your day job with Westfield Sports. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Is there any uh, Leah time or is it pretty much, you know, going from one to the other and, you know, extremely busy during that football season? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm definitely extremely busy. Um, I, I enjoy being busy. Um, and I've certainly got a... Um, I think a, a much better life work balance than when I initially started coaching. I think when you start initially jump into coaching, you, you sort of say yes to doing everything and you want to be exposed to, to so many different things. Um, but it's the, it's the quality of the content that you're viewing or the, the conversations you're in and what you're engaged in that becomes um, critical that you do moving forward to ensure that you do have that work life balance so uh, certainly um am busy but i've got a good amount of downtime too to spend time um with doing things for myself yeah and obviously you know i think that a lot of people think it's downtime for football coaches at the moment and obviously you're working with the future matildas group and i know doing a little bit with you um at the moment it's still hammer and tongs and you're still working 
uh, a lot to keep that program running. Is there any ideas that you've come up with that's, that's made you think because of the restrictions we have that you think you may use when we go back into um, when everything's back to normal? Yeah, look, I, I think that um, this has given us a good amount of time to develop some good resources, um, some home training resources that, again, I, I mentioned before, kids in remote areas, you know, can they access some of that content um, where they can they can watch things online? We've involved the Future Matildas recently in um, some good Zoom, like team meetings, webinars, where we've had different guest speakers. And we recently had a young lady um, called Nicole Christoulou, who's a part of the Australian um, National Cerebral Palsy Team. Now, what an inspiration, what an incredible story. Um, and, and this young lady's in our football community and um, we haven't had the opportunity or maybe not have thought of accessing people like that to, to hear their story, how they can influence a group of up-and-coming players and um, inspire sort of the next generation um, as opposed to celebrating the US current best US national team player or whatever it is we, you know, as coaches might have, have done in the past. So, look, I think we're developing some good resources for these times. Um, again, they can be used for kids in regional areas. Um, you can cut down on, on travel if we have, you know, team meetings um, via Zoom once a week as opposed to all congregating in, in one area to, to go through video. It's, it's really opened up a, a lot of different avenues for us to continue to educate and deliver our program. Yep. A few different roles. Um, obviously, if you're involved in Matildas or young Matildas, etc., and there's a tournament at Tesori Mall team-based with future Matildas and then at Westfields, what, what's the key differences in what you coach and how, how what ideas you present to players is there a difference or they're same? Look, we in a in a sports high school environment and moving forward with the the future Matildas environment, um, it definitely gives us that contact time to work on an, an individual. So um, if we look at the individual skills, the um, principles of play, um, those sort of areas are really really saturated um, in those two environments. Um, it, we're not working towards a game on Sunday um, where it's that, that team orientated. Um, in saying that, we do work on um, tactical points of the game and, and introduce different principles of play in terms of um, our style of play and those sort of things. But it certainly um, gives us time where we can work on a really break down an individual technique and, and go from isolated to under pressure and and just work with that that individual in all areas, whether it be nutrition, psych, um, technical, tactical, physical. Um, those players are certainly saturated with it more so. And do, the, do the session numbers change when, that, when you're doing a more individualised session for players? Do, do the numbers in the sessions change? Is there small groups? Is it still big groups? Does uh, look, it vary? Yeah, it, it varies. We obviously, at the end of the day, the techniques we're working on, the players need to execute in an 11 v 11 scenario. So we'll build up from, um, as I said, isolated technique to small sided into 11 v 11. Um, and that's how we'll sort of structure our week with a topic where, you know, we'll introduce the technique, then again, increase the, the pressure with the, the idea that this, whatever we're working on is executed under maximum pressure, which is the game. Do you see youth players coming through being technically better, tactically better, the same? Is there is there a drop? What have you seen with the younger players that you have access to now? Look, I think we, we're certainly um, stronger technically with the um, introduction of SAP and, and those sort of programs where probably our to, I think our 2003 board are sort of the first fruits of SAP coming in. Um, does it need to be better at, at every level? Absolutely. Um, but it's a, it's a starting point. But the exciting thing is that um, we're recognising that this is the starting, this is the starting point. Um, do we look at, okay, so in the, in the SAP, um, the topic and, you know, some of the key areas, as an example, striking, striking of the ball. Can we move away from when kids learn learn that in the set period where they're just learning to strike with their laces, a range of techniques. So striking includes little round the corner balls, inside of the foot, outside of the foot. What 
what moment do players make these decisions and choose their um, technique to execute? They're the higher level um, principles and I think we need to bring in at that, that younger age to ensure that at the older age, at 15, 16, I've got a toolbox of you want me to bend it, you want me to chip it, it's a high line, I've got to play the ball in behind or somebody's coming towards me, that's a cue to play their feet. There's just there's so much I think we can add in at that younger age. What would be key advice you have for a regional player and what key advice you have for a regional coach? Um, look, in terms of the regional player, I think, and I said it at the start of this, if you really want to be a professional footballer, national team player, whatever your end goal is, it's going to come down to you. And it's going to come down to how much you want it, how committed you are um, to achieving that goal. So if you're unsure about what you should be doing with your training, you need to seek advice from coaching staff. You need to be constantly challenging yourself um, to ensure that you end up the best version of yourself. Now, whether you, if your goal is to become a, a national team player or whatever the end game is, um, commit to it and see where you get. What's the, what the worst that can happen? You, you fall short, you've still worked towards something, you've still set goals. Um, that would be my, my biggest thing for regional players. And then um, for the regional coach, very similar. If you want to, um, whatever goal you set, become a better coach, become the country state coach, become the Matilda's Socceroos coach, go overseas and coach in China, whatever it is, um, you've just got to commit to your own development. Because at the end of the day in the, the coaching world, um, you are very much on your own. So it's, it's got to be that from the start that you committed to you. I guess we've seen so much com campaigning lately about getting one here. What do you think a Women's World Cup would do for Australia? Oh, it would be a game changer. It would be phenomenal for the, the country as a whole, um, as well as obviously our, our, our football community. Um, I think the idea of um, with teaming up with New Zealand is excellent. And um, I, I look forward to us, hopefully, um, hosting World Cup. We speak about, I suppose, role models and all kids look up to certain players and things. As I know you've worked um, at all levels, is there someone that you've looked up to as a, as a player when you grew up or someone that you think young, young girls should look up to and model their game off? Um, yeah, look, I... I definitely looked up to um, a, few, a few people throughout my career. Um, somebody who comes to mind who first took me in um, in the Matilda setup was a, a former player called Diane Allegic. Um, so she's certainly somebody who um, I've always looked up to and appreciated her support. Um, again, I, I go back to having several mentors at the moment who support me and, and offer um, good advice. Um, as a as a youngster, I have to say Julie Murray, I always uh, looked up to and thought she was <laughs> pretty good. So, yeah, there's definitely been a few um, players who throughout my career um, I've, I've either aspired to want to um, reach the levels they did or, or be consistent and the kind of good people that they've turned out to be as well as footballers. That's really important to me. I guess we've had one common question we've asked everyone on the show so far, but are you on Messi's side or Ronaldo's side? I have to say I'm on Ronaldo's side. Yes. yes. <laughs> I have to say both are very impressive footballers, um, but I'm, I'm definitely on um, Ronaldo's side. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate you being on today, Lee. There's some really great insights there for players and for coaches, and I've certainly got some insights for myself, so... I'll be, I'll be taking some notes from, from your conversation and advice as, as well. So thanks very much. I appreciate you very busy. But we certainly uh, acknowledge the time you've, you've put in and we appreciate you coming on. So thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. It was an absolute pleasure. Great. Thanks, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Thank you.